Hey you. Yeah, you. Thanks for sticking around. What an absolutely frantic, furious year for the MMA league. You and I had the opportunity to sit next to the Octagon for some of the biggest moments that we have ever seen in the UFC's history. Another year has gone by. You never feel this level of happiness if you don't go for something. Another year of me following this crazy ass sport. If you know my story, you're gonna love me. Streaming, watching with eyes glued to the screen, slowly digesting, barely processing, and then brainstorming, writing, editing, and putting out content with just a shred of sanity left. Believe it or not, this whole thing is hard work, but with every brutal knockout, every masterful submission, stare off, and every epic war waged in the infamous octagon, I'm reminded why I keep doing this. It was one of the funnest years that I've ever been a part of as a part of the UFC. And I get right back on my laptop and resume where I left off. This video especially was hard fucking work, but here's to the sport we all love, mixed martial arts. And today, we will celebrate the good and mourn the bad of 2023. Check out the Patreon for a music playlist, video thumbnails, and get your name in the credits of each video, and some pretty dope editing breakdowns. I got a lot for you over there, but over here, we'll go over eight categories in total. So many nominees, so many close calls, but one victor for each. And looking back at 2023, I can say for sure, 2024 will have to be something else to surpass this one. Greatest face-offs. Talk to me about the stare down a little bit. Not a uh, intimidation. It's already you, happening. So you don't but have some to... guys are really good at it. The face-off, whether at the press conference or at the weigh-in, is the fight before the fight, emotional and psychological rather than physical. You have two athletes who will beat the hell out of each other on live TV, trying their hardest not to throttle each other right there and then. The following three face-offs had it all. Hype, intensity, and begrudging respect, all at the same time. Runner-up. Hamza Chemaev versus Kamar Usman. Hamza versus Usman was a dream matchup at 170 for a few years. The unbeatable champion versus the unstoppable contender. Sadly, this fight slipped away and we weren't sure we would ever see these two in the cage. I'll go down and fight you. But then you, you say, uh, no, I don't want to make that way. Come up to little way to fight me. But 10 days before UFC 294, Usman was brought in to face Chemaev on short notice. It was a little late, but we were getting it. The respect was apparent, but at the face-off during the press conference, these two welterweights still wanted to kill, and they were still the beast we knew them to be. Israel Adesanya versus Alex Pereira. For the second year in a row, the components of one of the greatest combat sports rivalries end up here. Last year, Israel was the champion and Alex was the challenger. With the defeat at UFC 281, much had changed. And in the press conference to promote the rematch at UFC 287, Adesanya was staring at his apocalypse. And that apocalypse looked right back at him without blinking even once. Winner, Alex Pereira versus Yiri Prohaska. Stare downs and face offs are amped up when there is something extra on the line, prior history or bad blood, but there are matchups where the two fighters are the classiest guys on the planet, and yet they stare at each other as if a familial feud has been going on for decades. Our winner for this category the engaged stare down between former middleweight champion Alex Pereira and the former light heavyweight champion Yiri Prohaska. The crowd was losing its mind over what was to come but I'm pretty sure Alex and Yiri felt like they were the only two people left alive in the world. It was that intense, and on some level, personal. No! Greatest on the mic. It's entertainment and it gets people, that, that's another reason why I used to do it, you're trying to sell the fight. Every new year, we are reminded why selling the fight on the microphone is almost as important as performing in the ring. The WWE merger was finalized this year, and maybe that is why we saw more than a few pipe bombs detonating in the UFC world. You want every product you're involved with to be as popular as possible, whether it's a podcast, whether it's fighting, whether it's yeah. but whatever it is. If no one's watching, no one gives a fuck, then you're not going to make much money, you're not going to get booked again, you're not going to be on the big cards. Runner up. Alessandre Pantoja. It's badass when you throw up one liner after an epic display of combat. The double champ does what the fuck he wants! But 
there are times when you speak from the bottom of your soul after leaving everything inside the octagon and you end up here. Pantoja, the dark horse of the most underrated division, finally claimed gold at UFC 290 and he didn't scream that he was the best in the world. He thanked his family at ringside and wondered if his dad would finally be proud of him. My mom, take care of me and my two brothers alone, you know. Now dad, you proud of me dad, you proud of me. Runner up, Drakis Duplessis. Initially, I was going to include Sean Strickland in this hail raising at the UFC 293 press conference, but once again, Drickis came out of nowhere and stole the show. Head to head, Strickland versus DDP is a close fight, but on the microphone, we all expected Strickland to clown him like he clowns everyone else, but then it got dark. Respectful and somewhat classy early on. Drickis and Sean Strickland got annoyed by each other, and at the very end of the seasonal press conference, Drickis became the first guy to rattle the middleweight champion. Why are you so angry? Bro, you think your dad beat the shit up you? you, you your dad doesn't have shit on me. I'm gonna show you what it's like to drag it. It was cold, dark and brutal, and that villainous laugh at the end, right in the face of Strickland, was so wrong, yet the perfect way to end it. Winner. Israel Adesanya. Israel Adesanya was on the edge of the world at UFC 287. He was facing his worst demon yet again, just a few months after getting knocked out. This is my eight mile moment. This is it. One more shot at this. I put everything on my back. And the MMA world was united against him. There was so much miserable history weighing on him, and one more loss, and poof, he would always be remembered as Platon's victim. Ele fez isso nas últimas três lutas. Ele falou a mesma coisa e não fez. Yet, despite all of that, Israel Adesanya finally did it, putting his boogeyman to sleep and finishing him off with three arrows for good measure. He had finally done it, and with the jeers now turned into cheers, Israel gave one hell of a promo to close out an epic rivalry. People, Earth, I hope every one of you can feel this level of happiness just one time in your life. You could almost feel his relief and happiness. I'm blessed to be able to feel this Again and again and again and again and again. Worst year. The MMA game humbles and disgraces fighter every year. Losing is a part of the sport, but then there is getting beaten into the ground and broken into pieces with the entire world watching. You can go from the greatest thing since pride to the laughing stock of the MMA world in just one year. Just ask these three. And the last one still hurts. Runner up. Kobe Covington. For as long as Kamar Usman remained champion, we were told that Kobe Covington was his near equal. And if Usman didn't exist, Kobe would be the welterweight king. People want to pretend Kobe can't fight. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> then Leon Edwards defeated Usman and changed the landscape, finally. After close to two years of inactivity, it was upon Kobe to remind everyone that he was one of the best welterweights on the planet. And in the build-up, Kobe was more Kobe than usual. No, I'm bringing you to seventh layer hell. You, we'll, we'll, we'll say what's up to your dad while we're there. Oh! With Donald Trump at cage side, the whole arena chanting his name, Usman out of the way, Kobe had to succeed. But he didn't. In fact, at the end of the night, he was booed out of the arena. I was watching him like, what the? Like, I didn't know what was happening with him. Like, he just wasn't doing anything. And everything he had built up over the last several years crumbled to dust. I don't know if he wants to start over, John. That's the hard truth. I don't know that we see Colby Covington again. Yeah, it's really I hard. It. I said it. That's what I was dancing around. I've said it. Two years of inactivity, 25 minutes of fear. And with just one fight, Colby Covington makes this list. Runner up, Ian Gary. Ian Machado Gary is undefeated. He fought three times in 2023, one dominant decision victory and two knockouts. So why is he here? Well, he lost his manhood this year. Gary is in an interesting spot. He was a very loved guy who, like so many, puts up the persona of I don't care. UFC 292 is where it all began. A cringe display of trash talk against Magni annoyed a lot of fans. Nobody. Nobody is allowed to ask Neil Magny a question today. He's to sit there and reflect on the that he said because why he said was ridiculous. And after that, it was one burial after another. Wag books being kicked out of gyms, Sean Strickland educating him, and finally pulling out of his fight at UFC 296. That was the final nail in the coffin for this undefeated prospect. And it got to him. The guy that believed he didn't care turned out. He did. Hated by damn near everyone in the MMA world, Gary is no longer viewed as a prospect, but public enemy number one. 
and something else I just cannot say here, but you already know. Winner, Tony Ferguson. This hurts just as much as last time, maybe even more. The rise of Tony Ferguson was unlike anything we had seen before, and his brutal downfall is no different. Maybe the most depressing one of all time. I would love to see Tony retire. In 2022, Tony Ferguson won this category as well, but in hindsight, it wasn't as bad as now. He was knocked out by Michael Chandler, someone who can knock anyone out, and he was submitted by Nate Diaz, a bit embarrassing, but still one of the best submission specialists around. 2022 should have been the end, but Tony kept going and it kept getting worse. 2023, and Tony went from fighting Chandler to fighting Bobby Green, a fringe top 15 fighter, and El Kokoi was battered throughout before being submitted in the third, submitted by Bobby Green, but then Tony hit the twilight zone below rock bottom. At UFC 296, the former interim champion was defeated by Patty Pimblett, outstruck and knocked down in the first, and controlled on the ground. Tony did not, Tony tonight looked like he should retire. Ferguson tied BJ Penn for the longest losing streak at seven, and he ended up here again. Jesus Christ, Tony. Upsets of the year. 2023 was crazy in more ways than one. We had WWE and UFC merging together. Who saw that coming? At the end of the day, this, this is like one of the biggest mergers in the history of sports. Th this just takes the whole sport and everything to a whole different level. Maybe a few executives and people behind the scenes, but the upsets this year, no one, no one saw them coming and anyone who tells you they did is lying. We get at least one stupendous upsets every year, but in 2023, we got three. And even as I'm writing this down, they still don't feel quite real. Runner up, Drekas Duplessis versus Robert Whittaker. For a long time, it was Israel Adesanya, Robert Whittaker, and then everyone else. Whittaker was the championship guard at 185 and some thought he was more talented than Izzy himself. And it was simply about styles and a bad matchup. The way they match up, Whitaker struggles with, with Adesanya a little bit. Then out of nowhere came Drikas Duplessis. The South African native caught the ire of Israel and the company pushed him for a bad blood title fight. But he had to get past Whitaker. Good luck there. Whitaker. Whitaker all day. Robert Whitaker, Drikas. <laughs> Robert Whitaker was in another galaxy when it came to skill and technique. He was a master while DDP was a sloppy berserker. But we were wrong. I was wrong. DDP became the only other middleweight beside Israel to defeat Whitaker at 185, and he did it by knockout in the second round. The rather stagnant title picture at middleweight finally got a new contender after an upset none of us saw coming. Runner up, Alexa Grasso versus Valentina Shevchenko. For a long time, the hierarchy of women's MMA was similar to the middleweights. You had Amanda Nunes and Valentina Shevchenko, and then everyone else. Amanda was the consensus greatest fighter, but Shevchenko was not too far behind, and she seemed just as unbeatable. Valentina 125 is just a fucking monster. Yeah. She's yeah. a monster. Yeah. Yeah, she's, she's so good. After managing seven title defenses at flyweight, she ran into the same problem. Out of fighters to beat up, and Alexa Grasso was set up to be just another victim. But the first round went by and Grasso hadn't lost her spirit. In fact, she looked ready to score an upset. In the fourth round, she did, forcing the long reigning champion to submit. And in some ways, this was even more surreal than Amanda losing to Pena. Winner, Sean Strickland versus Israel Adesanya. Look at Izzy, best kickboxer in the world. But he's a weak man, paints his nails, jerks his dog off. At the top place, we have Sean Strickland upsetting Israel Adesanya. This wasn't supposed to happen. We couldn't even dream of this happening. UFC 293 was built around Adesanya, and he was supposed to defend the title against Drikas, but such a quick return was impossible for the South African native, and so he declined. Who was going to step up and face Israel Adesanya of all people? Enter Sean Strickland. Here's the thing about Izzy, man, the China man. Yeah, if we could start calling him the China man, oh, the China whore, Chinese whore would be nice. Uh, you, you fight a guy like that, dude, little twinkle toes running around, dance around, it's hard to shoot. You know, you're gonna have to go nose to nose, dick to dick, and make it a war. Popular belief was that Strickland, with all the ammo he had, was going to annihilate Adesanya in promos, and Israel would slaughter him inside the cage as a punishment. The first prediction came true, and Strickland stole the show at the presser. I'm ready to give what it needs to give. Because not only do I represent America, but I represent you guys. I represent you and then it was Izzy's time. Adesanya is really, uh, you know, like unique fighter. How one of the best? I think probably, probably a round two KO for Izzy. I think Izzy's gonna win by KO. To be honest. Um 
part two of the prediction went terribly wrong. Rock then nearly finished in the first by pillow fisted Strickland. Arasanya didn't know what to do for the rest of the fight. In the fifth, with the title win as certainty, Strickland was still not satisfied and he screamed at Israel to give him a fight. Michael Bisbing esque, as Mike Goldberg would say, but I'd argue this was even bigger and deserved the honor of being the upset of the year and the year of upsets. Fighter of the year. The most competitive category in the video. Fighter of the year, I mean, yeah. I don't know, I mean, who is that? This will invite a lot of discussions and maybe a few flame wars, but like I said in the last one, I welcome it. 2023 has been a year of great triumph for a lot of UFC athletes, but the following three achieved more than W. They won in the history books. Runner up, Alex Pereira. Alex Pereira is your fighter of the year. 2023 started on a bad note for the former glory champion as he was finally defeated by Israel and he lost the middleweight title without a single title defense. Adesanya had no plans for an immediate trilogy bout. I, th I think that Pereira probably moves to 205 after this fight. He's a monster, you know. And so Poitain went up to 205 to do what Israel couldn't, becoming champ champ. In his first fight at light heavyweight, he defeated former champion Jan and got a shot at the vacant title against the returning king Yiri Prohaska at Madison Square Garden, the same iconic arena where he won the UFC middleweight title. Alex landed that left hand yet again and became double champion in under 10 UFC fights. Not positive he's nominated for an award that he absolutely should win. And I'm coming to you guys hoping you elevate him and he could win it. Avenge Glover haunted Izzy became double champion. It was a damn good year for Poitain. Runner up, Sean Strickland. He's nuts. He's nuts. He's so out of he, his fucking mind. But that boy can fight. <sighs> Sean Strickland loves to fight, and he fought three times in 2023. He had something to prove after the close loss to Jared. And in January, Strickland was in the cage, defeating Imovov to begin 2023 with a victory. In July, Strickland knocked out Magomed, and it was now 2-0. But then came the big one. Oh, you think the Australians want the China man to win? They don't want the fucking China man to win. Nobody likes fucking Izzy. Izzy's a fucking cringe lord. Drick has declined a short turnaround to face middleweight champion Israel Adesanya in Australia, and Strickland was offered the fight. Third fights in a couple of months, and against arguably the best striker in the company. Of course, Strickland accepted, and he ended up winning. 3-0, and and a victory over an all-time great. Strickland himself was surprised at how easy it was. I still don't really, I still can't quite wrap my head around you guys. I thought it'd be a lot harder. But there is this one guy who had an even better year. Winner, Islam Mahachev. Islam defeated an all-time great contender in 2023 as well, but he did it twice. This was a legacy fight. It was a truly big deal. We find out how great the greats truly are in moments like this. In January, Islam defended his title against the featherweight champion Alexander Volkanovsky, and it truly was a super fight. Competitive and a masterful display of MMA. Islam won that night, but it was close, and there were some unanswered questions left. Listen, Volkanovsky didn't get the job done, but he pushed him to the limit. That was by far the toughest test of Mahachev's career. October, UFC 294, and the two champions faced each other again. Volk was brought in on short notice, and Islam had more time to rehydrate. I'm not going to go into too much details, just know this. Islam landed a brutal kick to the head and put Volk unconscious. Two title defenses against a pound for pound great and maybe the best featherweight of all time. I just show my level you now. I am not just wrestler, I am not just grappler. Islam started and finished the rivalry in one year, and for that, he is the fighter of the year. Greatest submission. Submissions will never get as much awe and respect as knockouts, but when done right, they are just as terrifying as a brain-rattling KO. It takes strength, opportunity, but most importantly, skill. Runner-up, Shafkat Rachmanov versus Jeff Neal. Up until UFC 285, Shafkat Rachmanov looked pretty much indestructible, but Jeff Neal tested him and pushed the undefeated prospect. But Rachmanov fought back brutalizing Neil in a clinch before eventually taking his back and strangling him with a standing choke to improve his undefeated record to 17-0. Shafkat hunts for submissions like a demon, and this one, face all bloodied and battered, was pretty much personal. Runner-up, Alexa Grasso versus Valentina Shevchenko. No one thought that Alexa Grasso would present much of a challenge to Valentina Shevchenko. 
Shevchenko had finally met her match in Alexa Grasso at UFC 285. The challenger was getting the better of the champion on the feet, and like the veteran she is, Shevchenko started grappling and brought the fight in her favor. But in the fourth round, she attempted a kick and Grasso took advantage, dragging her to the canvas on her back and hunting for a choke. One of the longest, most dominant title reigns in MMA history came to an end when Valentina tapped out a submission off of an ill-timed spinning back kick. A super impressive W, awesome, exciting. That, it makes it interesting. Makes the flyweight, women's flyweight division a little bit more interesting. You rarely see this, and when it gets you gold, you earn a spot on this list. Winner, John Jones versus Cyril Gaon. At UFC 285, John Jones made his return, this time at heavyweight, and his opponent was the first guy in over a decade to open up as a favorite against him. I haven't seen John in a long time, and uh, I haven't seen him fight at heavyweight, you know what I mean? So this, uh, I can't get a good uh, judge on uh, who's going to win because I just haven't seen John fight at that level, like at that weight class. So, uh, Cyril Gaon was supposed to show the light heavyweight goat that the heavyweights punched on a whole different level. But Jones didn't suffer a single strike, one takedown, and from there it was vintage John Jones, skill, leverage, viciousness, and just like that, his opponent tapped, and the greatest of all time only solidified his position with a submission victory in just over two minutes, after three years off. Oh, and Gon was the number one heavyweight in the world, submission of the year right there. <laughs> greatest KOs You get hit and everything shuts off, it just goes Burr. Bet this is what you folks were waiting for. Unconscious bodies hitting the canvas while everyone else in the arena screams their souls out. I don't blame you. One that really steals the show is the knockout. There is nothing more satisfying as a fighter or as a fan when the knockout blow is delivered. This is what MMA is built upon and known for, and 2023 served us a fair amount of terrifying yet satisfying knockouts. Runner-up, Sean O'Malley versus Aljamain Sterling. The biggest star in the bantamweight division needed the championship to usher in the golden age, but that title belonged to Aljamain Sterling, maybe the best 135 pounder ever, and O'Malley's worst matchup. Being in there with Aljamain too, I think he's a gamer. I, I gotta go with him. If Aljamain can take him down, maybe he's gonna win, but Sean O'Malley can knock him out. O'Malley, a sniper, needed to land that picture-perfect shot from the right angle at the perfect time and right on the jaw. And in the second round, he drew back and countered just as a certain Irishman did way back in the day. He said, I'm going to find his chin. He waited for his chance, and then he did Perfect it. angle, perfect placement, pinpoint precision, and the sugar era had begun. Runner up, Justin Gaethje versus Dustin Poirier. For the main event of UFC 291, the BMF title was brought back, and this time around, it was fitting. The lightweight division was home to actual BMFs, and two of the most violent ones, Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje, were selected to compete for the moniker of the baddest of them all. Poirier Gaethje main event, UFC 291 Salt Lake City. BMF belt on the line. They had fought years ago, and Dustin was the winner of fight number one. Fight number two was set in stone and had to happen. In 2023, it came full circle. Either way, dude, it's a, it's a heck of a fight, and um, I love what it's doing for the BMF title. And these two faced each other again. It's like a flip of a coin. Both more experienced, more bloodthirsty and vicious. But Justin just had a bit more. Justin Gaethje, known for concussing people with his bare hands, was now knocking them out with head kicks. Dustin was the first, and just like the year before, his kick to the dome was heard across the arena. Runner-up, Islam Mahachev versus Alexander Volkanovsky too. Speaking of head kicks, shin to dome heard across arenas, the pound-for-pound -pound best fighter at that time suffered a similar defeat. UFC 294 was supposed to be headlined by Islam versus Oliveira too, but a cut to Dubronx led to a change in plans, and Alexander the Great got the call. It's a crazy thing to do, but at the same time, it's exciting, uh, you know, uh, going out there and do it. If anyone can do it, it's me. A short notice fight against Islam of all people. Volk knew, and he told us that he had to put the pressure on early and knock out the lightweight champion, but Islam was a man on a mission that night, and in the very first round, we had seen Volk rocked, hurt, and knocked down, but concussed and out cold against the cage. That's the kind of knockout that ruins career. Runner up, Israel Adesanya versus Alex Pereira too. I know the work I've done. I know what I have to do. I, I'm, I'm gonna beat this guy. I, uh... 
fuck, I can't wait, man. It was deja vu in the main event of UFC 287. Adesanya was on the back foot, his leg battered, and his worst nightmare was marching him down. Timing on point and just a couple of shots away from yet another finish. 4-0 coming up, and rest in peace, Adesanya. That right hook came from the shadows and stunned the defending champion. Another shot planted Alex on the canvas, unconscious. Israel had come this close time and time again, but on that night, he finally did it. Tit for tat, vicious KO for vicious KO, but in sheer brutality, even this one was beat. Winner, Josh Emmett versus Bryce Mitchell. Josh Emmett might be the hardest hitting featherweight ever, but I feel in the past few years, we kind of forgot that he was. Important one in the featherweight division, Josh Emmett cannot catch a break. Emmett had a rough 2023 with defeats to Yair and Taporia, but he showed up at the last pay-per-view of the year and gave us the knockout of the year. Bryce Mitchell was on the unfortunate receiving end, and as soon as that punch connected, Thug Nasty was out, convulsing on the mat as silence prevailed in the arena. It took a few minutes for Bryce to actually get up, and I'm glad he did because some of us were fearing the worst. Right after he knocked me out, he could have followed up with the hammer fist and it probably would have killed me. He didn't even follow up with anything, and I'm so gracious for that. I will forever remember that. Josh and Bryce aren't world champions or superstars, but that knockout was primal and gets the top spot. That's the punch that gets you that you don't see. He never saw it. That's what the worst. That's the worst. The worst. Greatest fights. Finally, at the end, we look back at the best fights of 2023. Technical, skill, star power, entertainment, and gore. All shall be taken into account. Runner-up, Jared Cannonier versus Marvin Vittori. You put maybe the hardest hitter in the division against someone with an ungodly chin, and you get one of the best fights of the year. Jared Cannonier versus Marvin Vittori. Big fight for the middleweight division. Jared Cannonier and Marvin Vittori, main event UFC ESPN 47. And Jared was in rare form. I don't know what kind of energy crystal he channeled that night, but he beat the hell out of Vittori for almost the entire fight. Anyone else, and they'd be sleeping on a canvas but Vittori endured every shot and kept swinging back. He was stunned and bloodied up, but never knocked down. And Jared kept punching and punching at the same power all the way to the final bell. It was a gutsy display from Vittori and a Hulk level smashing from Cannoneer, rightfully awarded fight of the night. And he looked like he could run a four minute mile after you done with that fight. You look great. I wish I could run a four minute mile. <laughs> Runner up. Max Holloway versus the Korean Zombie. When Max Holloway versus the Korean Zombie was booked, fans were outraged. What were they thinking putting a battered veteran in front of the punching machine Max Holloway? My biggest thing is, does the Korean Zombie pinpoint a punch? She's able to take out Max Holloway because in every other area, when it comes to that, Max Holloway, you know, you could probably say he's got the better boxing, he's got the length advantage. TKZ was contemplating retirement just a short while ago, but the Korean Zombie welcomed this fight against one of the featherweight greats to close out his career, and he went in there to prove something. Everyone expected Max to just bulldoze through him, and while he was ahead of his opponent, TKZ made his own moment count and turned what was supposed to be a one-sided slaughter into a fight of the year contender. At the end, he charged headfirst in hopes of finishing the fight, and Holloway found the counter, putting an end to the fight as well as the career of the veteran. But that was just the perfect fight to send Zombie off into retirement. Runner up Justin Gaethje versus Rafael Fiziev. For years, the old guard at 155 were accused of sitting on their ranks and not fighting up and comers. Gaethje was the prime offender, and he fought contenders and jumped into title shots, but after the loss to Charles, he gave the new guard a chance, and Rafael Fiziev, the most savage of them all, was declared as his opponent. Uh, what, uh, what type of fight are you expecting from Rafael on Saturday? I'm expecting a fight that's going to blow the roof off this place. Um... Fiziev was younger, faster, and a better striker. And in the first round, he did look ahead of Justin. Rafael was looking so sharp and so clean, boom, boom, boom. But the veteran found his range and timing and started putting damage on the new guy. And, and Justin didn't, wasn't intimidated. It was what we expected from two top lightweights, violent and fought at a blistering pace. And by the end, Gaethje had done enough to win. Fiziev was left a bloody mess and with yet another fight of the year contender, Gaethje reminded us why he was still the most destructive lightweight on the planet. Runner-up, Dan Hooker versus Jalen Turner. At UFC 290, Dan Hooker faced Jalen Turner, and a lot of us had already written Dan off as a washed-up never was. That fight's very interesting. I'm not gonna lie, I'm very excited for this fight, but it seems like a bit of a, 
a bit of a murder fight for Dan Hooker, I'm not gonna lie. He was 33 and had lost a few key fights, but Dan still had his heart and toughness. And in that fight, he broke his arm, got his chin cracked over and over again, but said fuck it, went forward and went toe to toe with Jalen. Hooker had turned his white hair pink at the end of the fight, his non-broken arm was raised in victory, and he reminded everyone that he was one of the toughest fighters in the division. Winner, Alessandre Pantoja vs Brandon Moreno 3. Once upon a time, Dana White was ready to can the flyweight division but allowed it to exist for a little while longer. People who are true fight fans don't like smaller guys or don't like... I mean, Moreno and Figueiredo put on a series of exciting fights and when business was settled and Moreno walked out the champion, it was on to the next guy, someone he already knew. This of course is Pantoja, third time facing him, second official fight with him. Do, do you bring any of those memories into this fight? Moreno versus Pantoja 3 was the Coleman event bout at UFC 290. Flyweight title fights stuck between 145 and 185, but on that night, Moreno and Pantoja stole the show and continued the streak of steal the show matches at 125. They were damn near dead at the end of each round, but a few seconds on the stool and they were back up, back and forth, punch for punch and all the way to the final bell. Pantoja was the new champion and improved to 3-0 against Moreno, but nobody really lost that night. It was the fight of the year and all those who were a part of it, the fighters, the promoters and the fans, were all victors. Sometimes we get what we want, and sometimes we don't. The sport of MMA is as unpredictable as it comes, and it's most likely why I've been hooked onto it since I first started watching. So many happy moments, and so many sad ones, so many lessons to learn from this sport, and I try my best to spread them through each one of my stories. What a year for MMA, and what a year for TFB. Thank you so much for joining along for the ride, friends. And as always, I gotta bounce. I'll catch y'all in 2024. Get YouTube SEO masterclass, editing, breakdowns, all previous and upcoming videos, music playlists, downloadable thumbnails, your name in these wonderful credits, and so much more on Patreon. Have a look at it right here. And with that being said, I gotta bounce. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Peace out.